We've taken 2,000 years to turn Jesus into someone very different than that person who got in the water with John for baptism. He was Galilean, he was Jewish, he was peasant. Jesus turned his world upside down. He inaugurated a community that was so radical it threatened everybody. He was a wisdom teacher like the Buddha in many ways. Jesus spoke, announced, proclaimed the kingdom of God. He became human so we might become divine. Truth be told, there are as many Jesuses as there are followers of Jesus. Regardless of how faithful one is to the portrayals of Jesus by any particular denomination or tradition, no two people understand or relate to Jesus in exactly the same way. This is one of the reasons the Bible includes four different versions of the story of Jesus' life. And there are literally thousands of different denominations within Christianity. Apocalyptic firebrand. Mystical faith healer. Political insurrectionist. Sentimental sweet guy next door. Jesus has been the subject of considerable spin over the ages. Jesus is, first of all, a, the son of a teenage girl who became pregnant under what many would call dubious circumstances, right? Um, not everybody believed that she had conceived by the Holy Spirit. Jesus was the son or the adopted son of a blue collar person, a laborer. Jesus was not born in a city or to a family that was upper class. Jesus lived his life uh, and uh, his experience among the people who were the most marginalized both by church and society. He was a religious and political subversive. <laughs> That's who Jesus really was. They didn't kill him because they thought he was the son of God. They killed him because he was mobilizing people on the hillside and away from the synagogue. They killed him because he told Mary when she sat down to hear him preach that she'd chosen the better part. They killed him because he liberated women, because he gathered Gentiles. They killed him because he was in many ways an example of what the table of the Lord really needs to look like. That's really who Jesus was. He was arrested, he was tried, he was convicted, and he was executed. And most of us would not consider people who fall into any of those categories worthy of being the savior of the world. Kind of in a general way, if I was gonna say who was Jesus, the first thing I'd say is, he was Galilean, he was Jewish, he was peasant. Uh, he came from a very low social class, probably the very bottom of the, so I mean, we think of Carpenter as an artisan, but that means in the ancient world, somebody that's lost their land, it's off their land. Pretty desperate, frankly. Uh, so I mean, that's one side of it. And, and it's, a, it's a really important side to think about. You know this old game, where would Jesus come today if he came? Yeah. Guatemala is my pick, you know, some village out in the middle of Guatemala, certainly not to the United States. We're the new Romans. Jesus was among the outcasts. Jesus was among the people that we call the unclean of our day. Death row inmates, people in prison. You got to include in the whole swarm of people, gay people, uh, prostitutes, uh, people who never go to church. Jesus turned his world upside down. My reading of the story of Jesus, especially the Markan story of Jesus, is that it was all about crossing borders. Everywhere where the religious and political culture said that borders shouldn't be crossed, Jesus intentionally challenged the border and stepped into the other world. You can see it in the book of Mark beginning in the story of the Stormy Sea Crossing, which is the first place where Mark's Jesus steps out of his world of the Jewish tradition and uh, crosses over to the other side right? uh, and we're told of the torment of the storm as he makes that journey which is not just about the storm I believe but also about what his disciples were going through as he asked them to leave all of their comfort and emotional comfort and break serious religious law in order to go to the land of the Gentiles and then they get out of the boat in the fifth chapter of the book of Mark and they're met by their worst fear realized, the Gerasene demoniac. Uh, and then from there on, Mark has Jesus constantly, I think it happens at least six times, moving back and forth 
between the land of the Gentiles and the land of the Jews. Constantly reaching out to the people who were most excluded in his time, defying religious convention, defying political convention, and in the end, being killed in the most brutal way that their time had to offer for what he did. We've sanitized Jesus to the point where there's almost nothing left. Most of us have long since forgotten that the gospel is about sacrifice and that Jesus made it clear to his disciples over and over again, the only way to get to where you want to go is to take up the cross and go with me. And uh, so we end up in churches of privilege and affluence and a serious unwillingness to ask questions about what the implications of, of uh, our belief in Jesus are in this time. What does it mean to be a follower? Nothing has been more transformative in my life than the kind of unending mystery of opening up the gospel over and over and over again and reading about how Jesus just took on the, the uh, cultural mores, the religious uh, laws of his time and created a genuinely new kind of spirit and community. The literary genre of gospel is anything but objective biography. Gospels are not divine dictation of what happened, or even history as we understand it today. The gospels are a record of the developing traditions about Jesus from different communities. They are layered stories consisting of lots of elements, some going back to the historical figure of Jesus, and others developed out of the experience of the early Christian community. As one becomes acquainted with the style, vocabulary, and theological priorities of each evangelist, instances where they deviate from their own agenda, jump out as being either out of place or obviously taken from another source. Bottom line, the Gospels are subjective representations of Jesus, aimed at a community of believers in a particular time and place. Our challenge is the same as all the generations of disciples that have gone before figuring out what these ancient stories mean for us today. I don't think it's helpful to look at the Gospels as word-by-word uh, -word transcripts, as if, you know, Matthew had a tape recorder with him. It might be easier to think of the various statements about Jesus recorded in the Gospels or the various actions as we might, I don't know, think about a loved one who, who might have passed on. I can't remember in detail exactly the words that my father said and he died back in 1970 but there are various statements where I could say boy that sure sounds like something he would have said or that certainly seems like something he would have done so I think even though there are discrepancies for the most part if we read through Matthew Mark Luke and John we can get a generally good picture of what Jesus was trying to promote the personality of Jesus himself this individual who was able to gather disciples who was able to attract crowds by means of healing, by means of provocative teaching, um, who was sufficiently testy, sufficiently edgy, that people want to kill him. So although we have certainly differences, we also have similarities, and I don't think that the differences should outweigh the overall picture we get of an individual who's dedicated toward healing, whose force of personality drives a religious movement. Um, who might not be one all people would be inclined to follow, but is certainly one who was provocative enough that people might be inclined to listen. Our only sources for knowing about Jesus, except for one or two sentences in a late first century um, Roman source written by a Jewish historian, uh, Josephus. Our only sources for knowing about Jesus are basically the Christian Gospels. And so um, we don't have a lot of information about him. But the quest for the historical Jesus has been the attempt to try to arrange the material in the Gospels into earlier and later layers of material. And I think we know with a reasonable degree of probability that some things in the Gospels are quite late, the product of a developing tradition decades after the death of Jesus, and some things in the Gospels are relatively early. 
And so I think there are generalizations that we can make about the historical Jesus that have a fairly high degree of probability. For example? He was a wisdom teacher like the Buddha in many ways. Uh, he seems to have had an enlightenment experience himself and taught an enlightenment wisdom. I think we can also say he was a healer. More healing stories are told about Jesus than about any other figure in the Jewish tradition. And uh, finally, I think we can also say he was, um, my shorthand phrase is, he was a Jewish mystic. Now, mystic, uh, that's a, a vague word for many people, but I mean something both broad and quite precise by it. And you say that he never stopped being Jewish, nor did he really, apparently, at least according to you and other scholars, intend to start a new church. Um, right, and that would be a... Um, conclusion shared by uh, the majority of my colleagues in the discipline, that he saw himself as doing something within Judaism, not as creating a new religion. And he stands in that mystical stream of Judaism, a mystic very simply being a person who has vivid and typically frequent experiences of God or the sacred. So I see Jesus as one who, like Moses, and like other figures we could name, was a person who knew God. It's not just that he believed in God, but he's one who in his own experience had experiences of God or the sacred or the spirit. There is one thing that all scholars agree on, and that is that Jesus spoke, announced, proclaimed the kingdom of God. If you're imagining a bumper sticker or a, a key pin or something like that, it would be the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus spoke about. Now, what does that mean? Basically, it's, it's awfully simple. It means, what would this world look like if God sat on Caesar's throne? What would a, uh, what would a divine instead of an imperial program look like? What would we might say a divine budget <laughs> look like, <laughs> to put it in our terms? So kingdom of God is a way of saying Rome is not the kingdom of God, and after all, that's what Rome thought it was, since Caesar was divine and it had a kingdom, it must be the kingdom of God. And what Jesus is really saying is sort of in your face, Rome, you're not the kingdom of God, you're not even the will of God. In Jesus' world, who were peasants by the standards of conventional wisdom and tradition? Nobody. The great unwashed multitude who couldn't keep the fine points of the law and so forth. Conventional wisdom, tradition offered to peasants a profoundly negative identity. Jesus is saying, it's not where your identity lies. Your identity lies in the spirit of God. The way of Jesus is that movement beyond conventional wisdom into centering in the spirit of God. When Jesus proclaims in the Our Father, may your kingdom come, speaking to God of course, may your will be done on earth. That is exactly the perfect translation. May God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Heaven is in excellent shape, very well run and well organized, I guess. But the model of heaven needs to come down to earth. What Jesus is saying, would a just earth look like? What would an earth filled with justice, not force and violence, look like? And of course, that is basically high treason. It's non-violent. Jesus is not launching a, a military move against the Roman Empire, but he's saying that they are not the will of God and there's a totally alternative way of living that is the will of God. Threat to both Rome and the religious hierarchy of the day, he inaugurated a community that was so radical it threatened everybody because it wasn't just people who could keep the holiness code and do all the hand washing and keep all the laws of cleanliness and holiness. It was people who never washed their hands. It was people who lived what was called sinful lives. And Jesus ate meals with them. And Jesus inaugurated a community that incorporated all of them, even children. They weren't even considered persons. And that's what Jesus did that was so threatening. When Dom Crossan tells the parable of Lincoln High School, he paints a picture of an idyllic tree-lined street at the end of which looms the marble colonnaded entrance to the school. At the foot of the stairs is a large statue of the school's namesake, 
Abraham Lincoln. Kneeling on the other side of the stump from Lincoln, eyes looking up in hope and expectation, is an African-American slave. The slave's arms are stretched wide so that the chains linking his wrists rest on the top of the stump. Feet planted firmly, Lumberjack Lincoln stands poised with an ax above his head, ready to come down and shatter the chains of the slave. The question he then asks is, did this happen? Well, no, not literally, but is it true? Absolutely. The language of metaphor, parable, and artistic representations often express profound truths better than the raw historical data, a reality that the storyteller authors of the Gospels knew well. In the years after Easter, a number of ways of describing Jesus developed. Birth narratives were imagined that expressed the disciples' understanding of Jesus' special origins. Sayings and events were elaborated upon that the evangelists knew Jesus would have said and done had he had the time or inclination. Much of what we know about Jesus and his life are not facts of history, but images and metaphors. Not historical, but still powerfully true. What's the difference between the pre and post Easter Jesus? Well, it is the foundational distinction uh, of the whole field of the historical study of Jesus. So it's a crucial distinction. The pre-Easter Jesus, that phrase means simply uh, what Jesus was like before his death. It's Jesus as a figure of history, Jesus of Nazareth, this Galilean Jewish peasant. The phrase, the post-Easter Jesus, most simply means what Jesus became after his death. And when I speak about that more fully, I use two words. Uh, it's the, the post-Easter Jesus is the Jesus of Christian experience, that's the first of the two words, and tradition. And when I speak of the post-Easter Jesus of Christian experience, I mean that the followers of Jesus continued to have experiences of him after his death. And I think that's the historical ground of Easter, by the way. For me, Easter need not have anything to do with an empty tomb or something happening to the corpse of Jesus. Easter means the followers of Jesus continued to have experiences of his presence after his death in a variety of ways. Then you're saying that I can still be a faithful Christian uh, whether I totally believe that Jesus rose again three days later. Uh, yes, I would say the emphasis upon the tomb really being empty that's made by some Christians, and the emphasis that Jesus rose in a physical, bodily way from the dead, uh, I think that's really a distraction because it turns Easter faith or Christian faith into believing that this really spectacular stuff happened a long time ago. Whereas I would say Easter faith, Christian faith, is about our present relationship to Jesus as a figure of the present. And if one has a sense that Jesus is a figure of the present, that is manifestly true independently of what did or didn't happen on a particular morning in the past. Is it as unimportant as the uh, ongoing debate uh, uh, argued within the Gospels uh, about whether there was a manger and uh, where Jesus was born and whether there were wise men uh, or shepherds? I think it is very much like that. I don't think the truth of the Christmas stories is dependent upon uh, whether Jesus was born in Nazareth or Bethlehem, whether there were wise men, whether there really was a star. I think the truth of the stories is in their ancient uh, archetypal religious symbolism, those affirmations that Jesus is the light and the darkness and so forth. So also with the Easter stories. I don't think the truth of the Easter stories depends upon whether or not there was a tomb that could have been photographed empty. The thing that um Western Christians especially have a hard time getting their mind around is first of all there's no orthodox doctrine of salvation there are lots of different understandings of salvation of which atonement is one option and it's been the prevailing one in the Western Church but there was no official council or anything that decided this had to be the only way you could believe 
in salvation as a Christian or you weren't a Christian. And the whole humanity divinity of Jesus was more the preoccupation of the early church, but I think that's because they understood that Jesus came to bring to us the same Spirit of God that He embodied in the flesh. As Athanasius says, He became human so we might become divine. Something in my mind, I see Jesus walking around as a horribly oppressed person with a whole lot of clothes on, <laughs> pressing him, just layers and layers, you know, just lots of things that is, we've taken 2,000 years to turn Jesus into someone very different than that person who got in the water with John for baptism. And there's political stuff, there's economic stuff, there's church stuff, you know. Everybody, Jesus is a plank on many political platforms. Jesus is the reason that we go to war. Jesus is the reason we oppress the immigrant. This Jesus is even mad at Mickey Mouse because, or, or the Teletubbies, you know. <laughs> we do more stuff to Jesus than, than the law allows, in the truest sense of the word. But there comes a point when, when Reformation is really in the air, when we have to undress Jesus, we have to take all the stuff, all the crap that we've put on Jesus, all of these layers and layers of tradition and all of our different ideas and theologies and, and get back to the Jesus that stood in the water with John. Whenever we emphasize the divinity of Jesus at the expense of his humanity, we lose track of the utterly remarkable human being he was. One of the most interesting things that everyone knows is there's only really one Jesus. And yet we have four, people usually say four Gospels. Actually, we have four according to. There's only one Gospel. The one Gospel is that not Caesar, but Christ is Lord. That's the good news. Caesar doesn't run the world. Caesar just thinks he runs the world. It is God who runs the world. Now, that Gospel, that good news, that one good news is a told according to Matthew, according to Mark, according to Luke, according to John. So what I get when I read those is, ah, that good news has always to be reinterpreted, applied to different times, different places, different groups, different communities, different problems. So the message I get from the fourfold gospel is, what's your gospel? How do you apply the gospel now? How do you take that one unique gospel and make it according to contemporary American, let us say. The evidence we have as to the identity, actions, mission, and vision of Jesus varies widely depending on the source and theological filter. Matthew, Mark, and Luke portray Jesus going to those who were hated and despised and declaring God's love for the outcast and stranger. John attests to God having so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And while theologians have long debated Jesus' true mission, that of apocalyptic prophet, sage teacher of wisdom, or sacrificial lamb. The variety of images and stories of Jesus seem to point to one reality. This is someone who is beyond all description, and at the same time so embodies what it means to be human that his earliest disciples could only describe it with the idea of the divine. Our awareness of the origins of the Gospels, the traditions which have formed our image of Jesus, and the continuing struggle of faithful people to understand the complex and radical message of Jesus are all critical elements in understanding how we might live a Christian life today.